Live and in person. Thursday. What's the date today? It is Thursday. The 11th of March, <laughs> 2021. And we are coming to you today. Our top story today is... The top five ways, creative ways, to get your offer accepted in this market. It's a crazy seller's market out there, and we have heard of some wild things going on, but we have five more best practices ideas for you today on how to get your offer accepted. Okay, the number one thing that we hear all the time is, what price should I offer? So in our example here, we have a $775,000 house, and the question is, what price do I offer? We always come back with the same answer. You know, offer everything. Go all in on the price that you think it should be. So let's say your price is 800000 And then in 30 days, the house closes for 801000 The buyer goes, oh my gosh, I would have paid eight hundred and one. That's what we mean by going all in. If 801 is your number, then instead of going 800, go 801. What if it's 805? What if it's 810? Whatever that number is, when it closes and we know what the property closed for, you go, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have paid that much because I made the offer all the way in when we did it. So, and it's so disappointing. So many times we've seen people come in after the property closes and it's one, two, three, or four, five thousand dollars more than what they offered, and they always say, I would have offered that. So, our advice on number one is go all the way in. If you don't get the property and it closes for $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 more, dollars, you go, I wouldn't have paid that much anyway. That's right, especially in this mar uh, mar uh, market. Um, the other way you can tend buy a property and be very competitive is pay cash. It eliminates the appraisal contingency and it also gives you a lot of flexibility on closing. You can close very quickly when you're paying with cash if that's what the seller needs. So one option is also to pay cash if that's a possibility. You can always waive the appraisal contingency because that's the big if these days. Prices of property are going up so fast that every time a property closes, it's the new comp for the neighborhood. So another property comes on, the appraisers come in, they look at the closed properties, the appraisal doesn't come in. So if you waive the appraisal up front, then the seller has the confidence that the appraisal is not going to be an issue. Now to do that, you need to have the money in the bank. Let's say the appraisal comes in 10, 20, 30, $50,000 under what you ask for it. You've got to have the money to make up the difference. That's right. That's right. So we, uh, another way, make sure you are pre-approved. You need to be pre-approved. That means you've turned in all your documents, it has been through underwriting, you are ready to go as a borrower. So the only thing that needs to get done um, to get your loan done is the, the conditions of the property. But you as a borrower have been fully um, vetted and underwritten and the underwriters have seen your documents, so you are fully ready to go. Yes, and another thing that we've seen, we don't feel like it's an effective at all but there is an escalation clause and it's like I'll pay a thousand more dollars or five thousand more dollars than the highest verified offer. What that means is we're going to take the $775,000 example that we used and we're going to say, hey, okay, I'll pay five thousand dollars over the highest offer up to eight hundred and twenty-five thousand. Sellers get very confused on that. They're saying, if they were going to offer 825000 then why didn't they make that offer? Why are they using other people's offer to up their offer? So our advice is to stay away from the escalation clause. It confuses the sellers. And if you're going to make it up to a certain number, just make that offer your certain number. What do you think, Lise? Yeah, that's right. Because what confusion creates, people will not make a decision when they're confused. So it slows down the process and, and it creates just a lot of uncertainty, especially in this market when the average national average is sellers are getting at least three offers, um, depending on the price point here in Ventura County, uh, so, uh, sellers can be getting more than that many uh, uh, offers. 
So you really want to write a clean offer. It, absolutely. As clean as you possibly can. Like Lisa said, eliminate the confusion. And that leads us to number two. Keep it simple. <laughs> That's right. Yes, be first in, be the early bird. Hey, it doesn't matter whether you're the first offer or in the first few. You probably don't want to be the last offer. Sometimes those get looked at, sometimes they don't. It just depends on how overwhelmed the seller is. Generally speaking, let's say a property is going to get 10 offers. We're going to use the 775 example again. And let's say that out of the 10, you're going to have 8 of the 10, let's say in the 800 range. They're all going to be right there within a few thousand dollars of each other. And you're going to have one that's way up and one that's way low. So ultimately, the seller is trying to pick the best offer for them, and it's not always the highest price that they're looking at. Yeah, if you can find out the motivation of your seller, it always helps you because you can gear your offer to be whatever they need. If they need more time, less time, um, they want to leave the, prop the stuff in the property, or, they or price is most important. You just don't know uh, what the seller's mo motivation for selling is. Um, and another thing you want to do is um, write a clean offer. So you don't want to ask the seller in this environment to do anything. So you don't want them to have to pay any extra things, pay any closing costs. You definitely don't want to be contingent, writing a contingent offer where you need to sell a property to buy a new one. Um, that is just taking you out of the market because they have other choices on things that can close that aren't contingent. Um, it is happening here and there but generally not. People are selling their properties. We just heard about one today where they are selling their property and moving in with their parents until they can find a home, but they will have their money in their pocket to be competitive when they go to write an offer. Yes, because contingent offers usually end up on the bottom of the pile That's right. when, they, when they're a seller. Now, the one way to get it raised up from the bottom of the pile is through relationships, and that happens through professional relationships. When you use Lisa and I, we know everybody in town. Not always a guaranteed success, but more success than not. That's right. Um, another thing about people want to write deadlines in their offers, like you must respond by X time. Well, that's just not seller fr uh, friendly. You want to give the seller the time that they're go they're going to need when the offers are pouring in, and you just need to write a strong, clean. Uh, uh, offer and then yours will make it to the top of the pile. Um, sometimes when you get into counters, if you get there in this market and you get counter offers, you might be more inclined to want an, uh, a response quicker because you know the, the real estate changes every second when there's offers and counters flying around. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up about deadlines. Yes, a lot of times property will come on the market, the first offer that comes in hey, my client doesn't want to be in a bidding war, they offered full price, we're going to expire that offer in six, eight, ten hours. It's like, really? We've only been on the market six, eight, or ten hours, and now we have to make a decision in that amount of time or your buyer's going to go away. Sellers don't like that. They don't like to be pressured into making a decision, especially in this environment, because they know they're going to get multiple offers. They want to see everything that's out there and then make an informed, intelligent decision going forward. That's right. Number three is pay the seller's fees. So if you have an opportunity where you have more cash, maybe you don't want to make the price of your offer higher, but you will pay some of the seller's fees. So it actually makes the seller's net amount of money they're going to walk away with higher. So that can be anything from title fees, escrow, um, the city report, you know, all the things that the sellers pay, the natural hazard disclosure, HOA documents, so all the things like that that are seller expenses, you might offer to pay those for your seller to make your offer just a little sweeter. It would be. I mean, most sellers, when they're on the market, they already have a seller's net sheet. So they know what their expenses are going to approximately be. It's a broad brushstroke, but that gets within a few thousand dollars of actually what they're going to net from their sale of their house. So you, as a buyer, say, hey, I'm going to accept this fee on the HOA. I'm going to pay this. I'm going to pay that. I'm going to waive the appraisal. There's not going to be any repairs. It's going to take the property as is. You move way up the list, and they can just go 
down and just check the boxes on what the buyer's going to pay, that always makes the seller happy. That's right, that's right. So number four is take the property as is. You know, especially if it's maybe someone moving out of state or somebody, an elderly seller, and there's a lot of uh, personal property in the property, and you don't mind, you know, getting rid of, rid of it or taking it as is or making the sellers move as easy as you can, offer to take the property as is. I mean, that means as is, it can be as is in, in the condition, or it can mean as is with uh, whatever personal items they want to leave behind. So you let the seller just walk away um, and then you can deal with getting the property cleaned out. Of course, we have people to help you do whatever you need in the moving process. So um, that process is not as overwhelming as it sounds, but yet it can be the difference for your seller on accepting your offer because you're willing to make it easier on, on them. And as this doesn't mean that you're not going to do your inspections, you're still going to do your home inspection and all the services, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, whatever inspections you need, rough roof, foundation, and you still get to do that even on an as-is property. That way you know exactly what you're buying the day you close. That's right. And number five is, I mentioned this, what is the seller's motivation? If you can find out what what it is in a competitive market like this, then you want to try and find out. Have your agent try and, fi and find out. We always try and see what we can find out, um, what's going on to know if their motivation is, like I said, price, timeline, uh, property condition, um, it depends what the seller needs. It is, and the seller's motivation is a broad spectrum of why they're selling their house. I mean, one motivation could be, hey, I need to sell my house, Put the money in the bank so I can go buy another property and be competitive in the market so they may want to rent back from you. And that may or may not have an end date on it. Now we strongly urge that you not do that, but sometimes you've got to be outside of the norm to get the property that you really want. So you would put an end date on it and say, hey, you need to be out by this. And you may even put a bonus on there that if you get out before, hey, we're going to give you a bonus to move out early. That way they've got an extra incentive to move out. Even if they don't find something to buy, they might move in with a relative, rent an apartment, rent another house. There's a lot of different options for them to do. Right, and they might rent back and pay you some, something for that or pay a prorated rent or you offer it to them free. Uh, so everything, everything is negotiable always, but certainly now, the more creative that we can be to make it happen, the better. Um, and, you know, we've done this for a long, long time, decades, and, you know, buying a home can be a very emotional um, roller coaster kind of thing, because you see a home, you fall in love, you imagine yourself there, you know, you lay in bed at night, you write an offer, and you're wondering, is it going to get accepted? You've remodeled the house, you've decided which child gets which room, and so then if you don't get it, you're just kind of emotionally distressed about that. But what I can tell you, after years and years and years and years of doing this, is that ultimately, even if you write a dozen offers that you don't get, the one you ultimately get that is your home is the best home and has all the features that you really wanted and fits your circumstances the best. And so, you know, like they say, the first offer is usually the best, and the house that ends up being yours is usually absolutely the best one. Even though when you're devastated that you didn't get house three or four, um, it ends up being that way. And I just have to trust me, that's how it works out. <laughs> it happens every single uh -huh. time. The house that the buyer ultimately gets is absolutely what they were looking for originally. That's right. And we have a couple questions here. Thanks you guys for watching this live. Yes, pre-approved is the next step to pre-qualified. So pre-qualified is kind of the first step, but pre-approved means an underwriter has actually seen your documents, it's been you know, through the process so that you are really further down the line and fully approved and fully aware of what all your fees and costs and mortgage payment is going to be, so everyone's on the same page. Right, pre-qualified when you call the lender, you're going to give them your social security number, your employment, and they're just going to pull your credit bureau. They're going to pull all three and they're going to take a look at it and go, oh, wow, you've got perfect credit. You've got 830 credit scores across all three bureaus. You look great. Let's go. Go out and look at a house. Now, pre-approved income tax returns, paycheck stubs, everything you've got out there, they're going to look at. 
that's what you want because that takes time. In fact, we heard this week that the federal guidelines on lending used to be a three-page summary that lenders would take on a housing uh, loan application. Now that has gone up to how many pages? I think it? it was 10. 10 pages. So they increased it from three pages to 10 pages. So it has changed dramatically. And that just happened as of, as of March 1st, so just a few days ago. And it's just not going to be as quick and easy as it used to be. It's still going to be easy. The lenders are going to make it that way. They don't want to make it difficult to buy a house. Well, they don't want to, but somebody around in the government does. <laughs> so, hey, Deb, how are you? Thanks for watching. We appreciate when you guys um, watch us live, and we like to bring you all the information to help your home buying and selling and investing uh, go as smoothly as possible. So we are always here to help answer your questions. And you can DM us with your qu questions. If you have something you want us to specifically answer on the show, we'd be happy to. And you can always find us at GaryAndLisa.com. Your real estate edge. Okay, very good. It's a wrap. Yeah. Yeah.